about to join Don Newen, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Newen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Newen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Nguyen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. What, what is up with you? What's up, Denise? Hey, sorry, hey, before I'm you tell me. Having... <laughs> you sound like you're about to hurt something. You're about to, sound like you're about to injure something. <laughs> There's just so much madness. <laughs> All right, well, hold on a minute. Hold that laugh, Denise. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Laugh In. I'm your host. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. My name is Don Newen. I've got the ever laughing Denise Simon on the other end of this radio show. And she's uh, laughing so hard that. I'm not real sure what might be happening down there in Tampa, but having said all that, uh, you are with me in my car, ladies and gentlemen. I am driving home from work, and in a moment, if Denise Simon can get her breath and actually speak the English language to us all, she will timestamp this show. <laughs> oh, timestamp. Nine eight. No, I'm but, saying it. I, I, I'm not laughing. Nine eighteen p.m. August the second, twenty seventeen. Okay, go. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is unlike any other radio show you will ever listen to on the radio, and I think that you will all agree with me at this point. The big thing that uh, that makes this show unique is that for the next fifty two minutes, Denise Simon is going to laugh. <laughs> And now you let me down, Denise. You're supposed to be laughing. What? Are you what laughing? the? What? The? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What the <laughs> hell is so damn funny? No, wait, let me well, set I, this up. Okay. Hold on, Denise. Okay, let me set it um, up because because the listeners need to know first of all that uh, we're not losing our minds. All right. So well, you may be. <laughs> okay. So now. Earlier today, listeners, and valued listeners at that, Denise Simon sent me a message in Skype that was almost complete nonsense. I couldn't make any sense of this. It just, what I did get out of it was that she couldn't wait for the drive time sit rep tonight because something extremely funny to tell me and and i i had to reply back to her a couple of times to be able to figure out that's what she was talking about because evidently she was laughing so hard that it was affecting her ability to type now here's what's going on <laughs> i'm driving home from work late at night denise is down in tampa i call her almost every night on my drive home sometimes donna and i both get her on the phone and she gives us a situation report, basically what's been going on all day, because while she's living 18 hours a day in the world as an intel analyst, I'm living in the world of rock and roll. Donna's living in the world of horse farms. We don't, we don't dive into the weeds every day like Denise does. And so we count on her for an invaluable, invaluable service to us. <laughs> You're still laughing. I can't help right? it. Okay. 
Let me ask you this. Are you laughing right now because your husband, which will remain nameless, is moonwalking or doing – maybe he's singing Bohemian Rhapsody while eating a popsicle. A popsicle. He does that from time to time. <laughs> Sings Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen while eating pop – what flavor popsicle? Uh, the blueberry ones. The, the blue ones or the orange ones. Copy that, Simon. Okay. All right. So let's get let's get after it. Uh, all right. Well, there, there's what the there's, hell is so damn there's, funny? There's there's three things. There's the Statue of Liberty. There's the Love Hotels, and there's the Russian repos. Where do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you want to start. I mean, good God Almighty, we're laughing so hard we probably aren't going to make it through the show. All right. Start wherever you want. All right. <clears throat> well, <sighs> I'm going to start with the Russian repos. And I'll, I'll set it up this way. And it we have to kind of go back a, a month or so or two months. I forget how long. Time does pass quickly. When Donald Trump gets up on in front of a microphone and talks about how ridiculous it was, the kind of money that Obama was going to spend on two new bouncing baby Boeing 747s that um, are classified as Air Force One when a president is aboard. And Trump All said right, it wait was a minute. Let me let me let me ask you a question about that. Is it normal for a uh, a president that is leaving office after serving his term to place the order for the incoming president's no. Air Force One? No. But in this that particular is not case normal. No, but in this particular case, I don't know how old the two existing Air Force Ones are, except that I would say they are, you know, they they probably probably don't need new ones, except to add new technology to them. But, um, you know, they're they're old enough that you know, I, I guess you could make a case for buying two new ones. But Trump saw the he he was you know, given the heads up on this and saw the price tag and thought it was absolutely ridiculous. So then he comes out and he comes out and he says, I placed a call to Boeing and said, you're out of your mind, cancel the order. We're not going to spend that kind of money. And then Boeing comes out and says, Oh, well, wait a second. You know, it won't be quite that much. We think we can knock off a couple of million, a hundred million or whatever off of these planes. And then Trump comes out and goes, see how, what a great negotiator I am. I just knocked off millions and millions and millions of dollars off these bouncing baby Boeings. Well, here's the, <laughs> here's the backstory. There's a company in uh, by the name of Trans Aero. At least there was until 20, uh, late 2016 um, that had placed an order for four 747s from Boeing. And when you do that kind of thing, you normally put up 1% and then the process begins in building them. Or taking a shell that may they already may have, and you start doing the whatever customization that you know the company wants, and then you start making payments. Well, which is exact, which is exactly what my company does with buses. You you buy a shell, you build it out like you want, turn it into a rock and roll bus, and then you start using the coach. So I'm with you so far. So the 1% was paid and maybe even one or two payments. But after that, the company went into bankruptcy. And a person by the name of Dmitry Medvedev, uh, who at one point was the president of Russia, gave the approval for Trans Aero because it was a husband and wife, fairly sizable airline in uh, Moscow that... Um, they got in over their heads after 25 years and they canceled. They went into bankruptcy and they canceled the order. So Boeing is stuck with two bouncing baby Boeings. Okay. So with, these, these planes, these shells were purchased by this company and it's a Russian company. Yes. It's a Russian airline. And, and they went, okay. And they went bankrupt and kind of <laughs> defaulted on the, I see where this is going. Um, so, so they, Boeing, they defaulted on this. 
Yes, and so Boeing repoed them. Essentially, really on paper, they repoed them. They didn't have to send out Dog, you know, the, the bounty hunter. <laughs> for or them. the repo Be man, I get it. Because they were all, they were sitting in the Mojave Desert in a, in a place called the Boneyard. And the Boneyard is full of thousands of airplanes. They're full of, you know, old commercial airplanes. They're full of um, passenger liners. They're full of old Air Force planes, uh, old DHL, Federal Express planes, and that kind of thing. But in the case of Boeing, these planes, um, I don't know how many are there, uh, but at least two, and they are stored in the Mojave because of the weather conditions keeps them from rusting out. And when it comes to the engines, they put a special kind of chemical and coating and stuff on the engines, and then they shrink wrap the engines. Well, when this, when Boeing had to repo these Russian planes, um, they went out and they got some pilots and they, you know, unmothballed them, got them out of the Mojave flew them around for, you know, to another location, decided that, um, you know, they were functional because Donald Trump said he wasn't going to honor this order that Obama had made. So the long and short of it is the, the order is going through for two new Air Force Ones, and I don't know when they're going to be delivered, but there is some kind of poetic justice here that... <laughs> <laughs> they were they were owned by the Russians at one point, and they were making layaway payments on them. <laughs> and, and that's why he got such a deal on them because he bought Russian repoed <laughs> Air Force One. Yes. Now there is a sinister side to all of this, and the sinister side to this is that the rest of the fleet that was already owned by Trans Aero is being sold off at sidewalk sales, if you will, and Iran shows up. Well, Iran only shows up to buy some of them because John Kerry and Obama gave Iran a whole bunch of money that they can afford to go to the, you know, the garage sale that Trans Aero is having to buy some of the leftover fleet. So today, interestingly enough, finally after a, a, more than a week, Donald Trump signs the sanctions legislation on Iran, North Korea, and Russia. Now, what happens after that signature finally happened? Dmitry Medvedev, my little friendly person over here that declared bankruptcy for <laughs> TransAero, he gets on Twitter today and starts trolling Donald Trump over signing the legislation. <laughs> <laughs> over what? Over, what? Over signing the legis the sanctions legislation bill. I mean, he was really truly trolling them. <laughs> oh my goodness! In fact, you I'm know, looking. I'm looking at the TV and Fox. I have it on mute, and there's Dimitri Medvedev's picture on it right now. They're talking. About it. <laughs> hey, I, Denise, I I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, this is one of the most um, lighthearted yet sickening situation reports I think I've ever gotten from you. Well, it actually gets a little bit better because I watched... Oh, nice! <laughs> I, yeah, I watched Dmitry Medvedev's troll, uh, you know, Trump on Twitter. So I go over to the CIA website and I grab a document that came out in, I don't know, the year 2000. And it was a document that referred back to when Stalin was in power, back when the Germans were going in and, and you know, invading Russia. And Poland was obviously the little country in the middle and the some Poli Polish military were fighting, you know, on behalf of Russia. So you know, Stalin, he gets his nose out of his joint. And what does he do? He kills about, tw he has about 20,000 Polish officers um, on, on, of all ranks assassinated. And, and they just do these several mass, you know, burial ground things, you know, mass. So I go over and I grab that, that link to the CIA site and I go over to Dmitry Medvedev's Twitter page and I said, dude, 
I know you got this Twitter army going on here, but maybe you ought to spend some time paying reparations to Poland for the 20,000 people that the Soviets murdered. How about that? And then I, I, I click send and I thought to myself, well, now I'm going to have a troll, whole troll army coming after <laughs> me and probably <laughs> I hey, might get. You need, do me a favor. Go over to your window, look out in the uh, cul-de-sac or the street. <laughs> and see if and I have any have Russian any... operatives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we talked about this last week. They could be your neighbor. <laughs> I was just in one of those moods today. I thought, you know. I can tell. I was just like, I, you know, I just really wanted to, you know, take aim and fire. And <laughs> so I took it out on the Russians. <laughs> Oh All right. <laughs> Good for you. Did you get any? Did you get any response on the? No, uh... no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> well, you they, no doubt you're on their radar now. Well, yeah, hey, um, I have to watch my own website. They'll probably torpedo my website. Oh, I think well, I did. Hey, was having. I was having. You were a having trouble with it. Yeah, <laughs> I was you having. having a... Yeah. Hit me with that earlier. Hey, go see if you can get into my site, and I couldn't. Yep. Hey, no doubt that uh, they've uh, decided to play back. Hey, um, all right, before you get into whatever the second thing is you want to talk about here, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the Drive Time Situation Report. My name is Don Newen. We've got Denise Simon on here with me. You're riding along with me in my car. I'm headed home. I'm actually flying right now because the traffic's moving so fast. Uh, 78 miles an hour. I'm on I-20 headed westbound. At Thornton Road, ladies and gentlemen, those of you from the metropolitan oh. Atlanta area will know where I'm at. But the traffic is boogieing right now, Denise. I, I'm having to hammer down just to keep up with things here. Uh, at any rate, this show's unlike anything else, as you probably uh, have been, been able to figure out. I could have an accident. Let's hope I don't, because this guy's moving into my lane right now. And uh, we could drop out because I'm on my cell phone again in my car. You're going to hear noise like this right here. That's a truck that I just passed. All right? So, you know, anything can happen in this show. But we also are going to give you 53 minutes of nonstop information on what I get every night, which is a situation report from Denise Simon. So, Denise, let's get back to it. What's next? The tostada. I'm, po I'm, a, I'm afraid to ask. The tostada posadas. <laughs> what the heck that, is that? That means hot hotel rooms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Toasty right. uh, posada. Posada is is a state run hotel. Okay. Now okay. here's the deal. Cuba seems to have a big problem because people are just having sex in the streets. And I hope that, you know, Mayor Cuomo is paying attention. But anyway, they've decided that they're going to bring back what they call the Mayor love Cuomo. Mayor, you mean Governor Cuomo? Oh, that, no, I, I, no, forget. I, I didn't. The mayor. What, what, the, what is his name? Mayor um, de Blasio. Yeah, him, 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 him. Yeah, sorry, him. Yeah, comrade, thanks. Comrade de Blasio. Yeah, that's him. Okay, okay. but anyway... So Havana seems to be having a problem with ha people having sex on the streets all over the place. So I guess they've decided because we've opened, you know, we've, we've, um, you know, standardized relations and, and re-established relations with Cuba and they have a tourism thing going on. And I think the tourists are kind of freaked out that people are just having sex in the streets. So they've decided to bring back these things called the posadas, which are hotels. Now these hotels, are rented for six dollars and fifty cents for three hours, and um, you know. Hey, wait a minute! Who <laughs> who sleeps for three hours? I don't get it, Denise. Why would they rent them for three hours? Hmm. I don't get it. Help well, me understand. This. I don't. Maybe that's the length of the Viagra effectiveness. I don't know, but uh, but <laughs> nonetheless, that's the going rate. Six dollars and fifty cents for three hours that you can get a posada. Now a posada, these are all state run. So now you have this, the the Cuban government in the hostel business, the 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 tostada posada business. 
And so they get them off the street so the tourists aren't offended. Well, all right, let me ask you this. Why are the... (laughs) Maybe this is a dumb question, but why are the citizens of Cuba fornicating in the streets of Cuba? Nothing else to do. They they don't have any homes that they can go do that in? Uh, I don't know. I have no idea, but obviously it's a problem that they have made this colossal decision. And it, the and the news report of this has actually gone international, Don, because the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, was one of the first to report it. I got a feeling that it's because, and I'm I'm maybe out on a limb here, but I got a feeling this is because the. Um, the population rate is diminishing in Cuba, and so they need to bolster the population, so they're encouraging reproduction. Well, they're they're doing it on the beach. They're doing it in parks. They're doing it on the seawalls. You know, they've got scarce housing down there. I guess there's a problem, so these people get a place to go for $6.50 for three hours. I wonder if uh, Jay Z and Beyonce are taking advantage of this uh, this uh, deal for three bucks. Uh, yeah, I suppose anything is possible. Or for three hours, I should say. My bad. Six six dollars and fifty cents for three hours. Watch this. Jay Z and Beyonce will be down there very quickly. Very quickly. Oh, All right, man. so we've got the, the hot hotel thing going on in Cuba. Um, what was the third thing? What's the, the third of, thing that was making? The, yeah. the Statue of Liberty. Okay, so um, in the White House press briefing today, um, well, first of all, Senator two senators, Senator Perdue and Senator Cotton of Georgia and Arkansas, respectively, are at the White House with Donald, the Donald, and they make this major announcement um, offering up a new piece of legislation, which actually isn't a new piece of legislation, but this new piece of legislation is to minimize the number of visas that we give out, which is a million a year, um, and we're taking it down to 500,000 where people come to get a you know visa to work here in the United States. And um, this piece of legislation says it has some stipulations to it. You got to speak English. You can't do the chain immigration, which means if you come as a qualified worker, highly skilled, blah, 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 and you're being hired by Apple, you can't bring your grandmother and your you know cousins and you know, all the rest, what they call chain immigration, the whole rest of the family. It's just you. Okay. So then after um, we do this little presser thing, which by the way, this bill is about a year old, um, but they just decided to kind of resurrect it today. Then we go over to the White House press briefing and Steve Miller, um, who is one of the policy advisors for Donald Trump at the White House, he gets up in, at the microphone at the podium and he's going to answer, you know, talk a little bit more about this piece of legislation. And of course, um, uh, uh, Glenn Thrush, he gets and asks his stupid questions, but here comes Jim Acosta at CNN. And after some back and forth, Jim Acosta says, so let me get this straight. What you're doing is you're, and I'm really paraphrasing how he said it. But he said, so you're narrowing this down to people only uh, from Britain and Australia that speak English are allowed to come into the United States. Well, Stephen Miller absolutely went off on him. I mean, absolutely went off. And then, you know, Acosta is trying to say, uh, but this is what the Statue of Liberty is about. And he had to go back to his phone or his iPad and start reading what was on the Statue of Liberty. And he didn't even get that right. And, uh, uh, you know, Stephen Miller just said, I am completely offended. You know, you, you, you're, you're trying to invoke your cosmopolitan bias on this whole thing. 
And then he said how, and when he said to Glenn Thrush at the New York Times, I think it was, he said something like, I'll tell you what, we'll just take all of the staff at the New York Times and we will replace them with foreign workers, you know, that are, that are making, you know, $15 an hour. Is that going to, and you get replaced too. Is that going to work for you? I mean, it's kind of like, when is enough and enough? I mean, it got really very testy in this whole thing. And Jim Acosta, he was a little contrite. You could kind of see it, the look on his face. He kind of went, yikes, you know, I probably said something kind of stupid, which he did, because the truth of the matter is there's about 60 countries across the globe that actually speak English and, and teach English as their first language. So that was a really a, a fascinating exchange. And if anybody gets a time, go over to C-SPAN and grab that when you really, if you missed it today, you do need to watch it. It was, it was a fabulous, fabulous thing. All right, let me ask you this, Do you, uh, and I'll I'll um, I'll lead with my response. I like Stephen Miller. Do you? Yeah, he's all right. He I, works I've, for me. I've he's also liked, a speech from day writer. One, I've liked him. Oh, he's I know a speech he is. writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I find him to be uh, right on the mark. I like the I like the guy. For whatever that's worth, ladies and gentlemen, now you all can go out and like him, too. Uh, let me welcome you while Denise is gathering her thoughts here. Um, hey, uh... Denise, uh, I had a question that came in from a listener out of North Carolina this week, and, I, I, and I'm glad I remembered to ask you this. The question was this, and you're going to need to dig, and ladies and gentlemen, we're going to find out how good Denise Simon is on the fly here. The question was, during the Obama administrations, when he was cutting military, which states were affected the most? Now, if you want to start digging into that, I'll do my uh, my little spiel and let everybody know what the heck they're listening to here. But uh, again, when Obama cut funding to the military and downsized the military, which states took the biggest hit and were affected most by that, okay? okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the Drive Time Situation Report. My name is Don Newen. I'm the co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio with my beautiful wife, Donna Fiducia. And on the other end of this conversation is the great, stellar, intellectual, invaluable, talented, skilled Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience. You can check out both of our shows uh, every week on Talk America Radio. You can find Talk America Radio at talkamericaradio.us where you can go to the schedules and see the entire lineup uh, of all the shows that we have on the Talk America Radio network. Nearly, I want to say it's getting close to 70 a week if I'm not mistaken. Ron Phillips is doing a phenomenal job over there. While Denise is researching uh, my question from a listener, I will also let you guys know that we are so grateful to be on some AM and FM radio stations. WDDQ out of Valdosta, Georgia, Talk 92.1. WJHC, Talk 107.5 out of Jasper, Florida. And in West Georgia, WLBB 1330 AM and 106.3 FM. We are so grateful that these AM and FM radio stations have picked up our programming and are helping us get the word out. Uh, thank you to Scott James, and thank you to Steve Graddock, and all of the folks in South Georgia, North Florida, and West Georgia. We value you so much, and we thank you. All right, Denise, have I given you enough time to figure out the answer to that question for well, our listener from I, North Carolina? I, I really want to help out this listener, but it's kind of interesting because I'm not sure that it, it, I, it you can actually spell it out or you can find it by state. The knee-jerk reaction would be Texas would be first because it has the most military bases. Um, but I can't substantiate that one. Um, I, I would not expect California uh, because, uh, you know, you need those votes out there. But uh, Texas, um, I would say, would be first. But I can't substantiate. That is an educated guess. I'm poking around here, and I don't see that there was anything that's listed by state. Um, so I, I, I might have to, you know, defer on this one. Well, is I there, tell you is what. There an see what you, 
yeah, see what you can find out on that over the next uh, over the next seven days, and okay. maybe when we come back next week. Uh, a big hat tip to our buddy Lawrence, also known as LJ, out of North Carolina. He's a big supporter of uh, of Cowboy Logic Radio, a big supporter of the Drive Time Sit Rep, a big supporter of the Denise Simon Experience. And he's a great patriot and a great conservative. Big hat tip to you, LJ. Thanks for the question. Denise will not let you down. She will come back next week with a full throttle answer. How's that? Yeah, I will. I, I will. Uh, I will write that down on a note. Um, military cut. All right. All right. So now let me ask you this, Denise. Um, I saw someplace. It may have been during lunch uh, when I was scanning through headlines. Um, McMaster, <coughs> excuse me, McMaster yeah. uh, has laid out some interesting comments regarding North Korea. He did. Uh, he said to Kim Jong Un, he he ought to probably not sleep well at night. Um. <laughs> What that now, necessarily is it, is, he might be trolling is, them, but well, yeah. But let me ask you this: Is that a comment that would usually come from McMaster, or would that come from maybe General Mattis or Trump? I mean, is that a normal comment? No. Uh, and bit of advice that would come from McMaster? It seemed odd. No. No, he shouldn't have said anything. You just don't put that kind of stuff out there. Period. And I, what's I, going I, on between Bannon and McMaster? Uh, there's some bad blood there. Um, you know, and and today they were all freaking out that there's you know a couple of people that have been eliminated off the National Security Council. A uh, person by the name of. Um, Harvey and somebody else, but you know what? It, it, it's like it hit the news today, and, it's, and I'm kind of doing a head tilt here because they've been gone weeks, and um, there were a couple others that. Uh, and Tara Dahl is there, and Tara uh, used to work for Michelle Bachman, and then um, you know she kind of went into the civilian world, and she, she travels some people that you and I both know to. Um, the Middle East, but she's on there, yeah. and she has she has no business being on there, in my opinion. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, Bannon got thrown off of the of the National Security Council. Uh, McMaster's running it. We don't know necessarily who is really there, uh, because I went over and looked at the website what two or three weeks ago, and it, on the White House website for the National Security Council, and it said right there, well, uh, it's under the this site's under construction. So um, it's a very dynamic payroll, if you will, on who's at the National Security Council. But there is appears to be some bad blood between McMaster and Steve Bannon. Uh, you know, Steve Bannon was a naval officer; he was a naval intelligence officer. Uh, and even Sean Spicer was a, you know, a, a Navy or is a Navy officer. Uh, McMaster goes back to the first desert storm. You know, he was kind of a tank commander. So, I mean, you know, he's been around too, but, uh, I think this is, I'm ready for something else to necessarily happen on the national security council. Now that we have Kelly in there, I think he's probably doing some assessing and go, going, all right, let's, let's see how we're going to work this thing out here. Um, Quite frankly, I, I was asked today about some of this, and I said my response really was, we don't need a National Security Council. That's my position. Um, Obama had almost 200 people on his, but um, we don't need one, in my opinion. And why do I say that? Well, you've got a situation room in the White House, and it is Wait staffed. a minute. Hold on, Denise. Hold on. Let me ask you that. Why do you say that? I'm getting ready to tell you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you see what Just I got to put up with every night? Just hush and listen to me. We have a yes, we have we have a White House Situation Room, which is staffed. 
um, you you have a military attache that is assigned to the White House that carries around um, the briefcase, you know, and it follows. Um, the briefcase, uh, you mean the, the nuclear football? Yes, and it follows okay. Trump everywhere he goes. He has a military attache, you know, in that mix, too. Um, anything that necessarily that the military knows, the Secret Service knows, because they, they are his protective wall. You've got a situation room that is a clone of the White House situation room sitting at the State Department. Then you have something called the interagency. And the interagency are the heads of key people when it comes to anything dealing with national security. That means DHS, EPA, because that's where the nuclear, I mean, uh, Department of Energy, I should say, because that's where the nuclear weapons are. You got, you know, the, um, the NORADs and all the command, you know, Pacific Command, European Command, Southern Command, CENTCOM, those kinds of things. Um, then you have the intelligence community, of which there's some debate of whether we have up to 17 or not. Um, and and, and the, the president or a White House day, presidential daily briefing goes to the White House every day. In the Situation Room, um, there are a collective group of intelligence people that confer with very friendly countries in times of real conflict. And I would argue that's going on now because of North Korea and we are you know, certainly collaborating on things that we know and who's flying where, what's going on in Libya, what's going on in Sudan, what's going on in Nigeria, what's going on in Yemen, Afghanistan, all these kinds of things. Normally those things happen about every four hours. So the point being, we've got all of these bureaucratic national security layers. I don't really think that we need to have a national security council at the White House. It's just another layer. And um, we saw that it didn't it did not serve well, serve America well under the Obama administration. And right now we seem to have a lot of conflict in the Trump roster of those that are on the National Security Council. So I think it's time that we just eliminate it. But that's that's what I think. All right. Well, what you think is real important, at least to me, it is. And I'm sure it is to all of our listeners. Um, Thanks. Now, uh, let me take a minute to plug your website before my next question, which has to do with Afghanistan, in, in case I uh, lose my mind for a second. So help remind me it has to do with Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to check out Denise's website. It's founderscode.com. Founders with an F, code with an E. <laughs> Dot com. And uh, here's the deal. You go to that website and you bookmark it and you visit it every day. As long as the Russians aren't hacking her, you will be far ahead of the curve. Okay? What she writes about sometimes, and Denise, you can attest to this, sometimes is almost like two years ahead of the curve. Well, right? don't go. No, not two years. Yeah. But I will yeah. say, uh, no, I will I'm, say. No, I'm, no, no, no. I'm talking about Benghazi. You were two years ahead of the curve. Uh, I will, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was on that one. Um, okay. I will say this, though. Tonight on the specialist, you know, the bowling show that I really don't watch, I happen to, you know, TV's on, but it's on mute. I happened to look over and they had Bin Laden's son on there and they were talking about the fact that he's taken over Al Qaeda and he's made a threat to the United States. And I, so I, I looked at it and I said, dude, I reported that like two months ago. So um, I was a little ahead of at least Eric Bowling's show on that one. But uh, well, you're, you're ahead of the curve a lot of the time. And ladies thanks, and gentlemen, my thanks. point is if you want to appear, if you want to appear, like I'd like to appear more intelligent than I actually am, then you need to go to Denise Simon's website, founderscode.com. All right, Denise, we got about 10, 12 minutes, I think, left. I'm not looking at my little timer here. See, ladies and gentlemen, there's so much that has to go into the preparation of a radio show that uh, Denise and I would appreciate it if you would appreciate what we do. And uh, I know you do because you're sitting here listening to us, by gosh. But, uh, you know, we got to kind of keep an eye on the clock here so that we don't go over. We got to get it all within the time parameters that Ron Phillips expects us to do at uh, Talk America Radio. And uh, 
Steve and, and Scott expect us to do on the terrestrial station. There's a lot that goes into this. I'm, I'm driving a car, working a time clock, holding my phone up so I always have a good signal so that we don't drop out on you guys. What can I say, Denise? Send Denise some money. Send Denise some money on her website. Do that. All right? How was that, Denise? <laughs> oh, I like money. I like money. All right, so um, here we I go. Did pl- Afghanistan. 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 Now, okay. let me tell you what I want to ask you. Um, I briefly read a headline today in which Trump was raising holy cane about what's going on in Afghanistan and saying, we're not winning, we're losing. And he's basically, and I'm paraphrasing and interpreting, saying that heads are going to roll, and if you guys don't start making something happen over there, generals in the, in the theater, I'm going to do something and replace you. Am I recapping that re- somewhat accurately? Well, yeah, yeah, here's the deal. He never wanted to be in Afghanistan, okay? And so now uh, McMaster apparently presented a plan. Now, I don't know if this plan was exclusively McMaster's plan from the National Security Council in Afghanistan or if it was in cadence with the Pentagon. I think it was exclusively McMaster's. Uh, By the end of July, um, uh, Mattis was supposed to present his. We have not seen any um, reports that he did do that. But what Trump has done is said, okay, we're going to give Afghanistan a year. Now, what does that necessarily mean? Well, a year is apparently Eric Prince of Blackwater fame has a couple of new companies since he has you know, left Blackwater and it went away. And he is the sister of Betsy DeVos, who is obviously the sister of the uh, secretary of the Department of Education. He has made a formal presentation to this White House at the behest of Betsy and he got access because of Betsy and he gave a full blown plan on how to handle Afghanistan. So if we pull out in a year, then we may pull out our forces in some form or fashion, but we will hand it over to contractors to deal with it after that. Now, the bigger problem is why we are where we are in Afghanistan is because of the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement of Afghanistan to this day, from what I can still see, are part and parcel, for the most part, remaining from the Obama administration. And which those are pretty much... With, with, which has to do with the, uh, uh, you know, first of all, fighting with one hand tied behind your back, not being able to shoot unless you're fired upon, what, a half a dozen times? Yeah, you something You know, the like rules that. of engagement... And are are with, sickening. Stupid. And why is it yeah. that Trump has not changed that, given the fact that he's been around for six months now, and given the fact that our soldiers are dying and losing in, in, in situations where they ought to be winning, and simply it is due to rules of engagement? Well, why and, Trump and not I. Changed it? A good question. And what is happening over there now is we have these suicide bombers. We had two. Americans died today because of a suicide bomber that hit a convoy this morning as I was getting off the air on Matt Bruce's show. Um, So it was a NATO convoy. Uh, I don't know what other countries were represented in that. They were calling it a NATO convoy, but we did lose two Americans in that one. So it comes down to not only... Denise, for, for years, you and I... You and General Paul Vallely and I, uh, Lieutenant General Tom McInerney, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Cowan, uh, Colonel Rob Manis, all of these, all of these heavy hitters in the military that are retired have been saying, if you're going to stick our military in harm's way, you need to let them go in and be the absolute lethal force that they were created and trained to be and stop pussyfooting around with all of this rules of engagement stuff. I find it deplorable that I do Donald too. Trump has yet to fix that problem. He could do it instantaneously, could he not? He could. Um, but here's the issue, what has happened because of the lack of rules of engagement. Under the Obama administration, we were only really fighting Al-Qaeda and the Corazon group. 
we were really not fighting against um, the Taliban because we were negotiating with the Taliban, if you remember. That's where we sent the five American, I mean, the five Gitmo detainees to Qatar. And we opened an end, we helped Qatar or approved Qatar for opening an embassy uh, in Doha for the Taliban. Now we have a Taliban problem. We have an Islamic State problem. We have an Al Qaeda problem. We have a Khorasan group problem. So the question then becomes we have to redefine the enemy. And now that we redefine the enemy, what theaters are we going to and what collaboration or help are we going to get from the other NATO members, forces that are there uh, and get the lawyers out of the theater? So, I mean, that's that's really kind of the, the, the problem with Afghanistan. All right. I got an idea. Let me run this up the flagpole and tell me what you think. How about we define the enemy as anybody that poses a threat to an American soldier? on the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I only went to the University of Tennessee, and I'm not any type of a political science or, you know, really whiz guy through my educational uh, background. But doesn't that just make great sense? Here's well, the rules of engagement. Here's the rules of engagement armed forces of the United States, if somebody poses a threat to you, eliminate the threat. End of story. <clears throat> then come home and spend the rest of your life with your family. How's that sound? Well, I would argue, too, that we, we really need to look at the rules of engagement in Syria because we're only fighting, we are only fighting Islamic State. But who else is in Syria? Well, you've got Al-Qaeda in, in Syria. And so there's a big brouhaha going on in Washington, D.C., about the uh, authorization for use of military force under George Bush, which is the one that we're operating under today, which is 16 and a half years old. Trump doesn't want to change it. The Democrats do. Uh, you know, and the way that it was written is Islamic State in Iraq, in Syria, under George Bush. So, I mean, he, his, his, AUMF predicted this. So uh, the Democrats don't like this. They want it redefined. It really doesn't need to be redefined. Um, but we are fighting in other theaters. And that includes Yemen. That includes, obviously, you know, Africa against, you know, Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram. But they are all, they are all Al-Qaeda offshoots. And we are fighting against Al Qaeda, but we're not fighting against Al Qaeda in Syria. We're only fighting against Islamic. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. So I go back to the Don Newen theory of rules of engagement. If it poses a threat to an American soldier, eliminate the threat. That ought to be the rules of engagement. Well, there is a little it's bit of divide here between Trump and Mattis because Mattis does want a new one. And he, the reason he wants a new one is it, it says to the enemy that the American people with their representatives through Congress are committed to the fight and that we are so committed to the fight, we are redefining and we're broadening the AUMF. So we do have, we do have a little bit of a problem. All right. Yeah, but here's, here's the problem I'm having. I don't understand why the verbiage that I just used for the rules of engagement, why anything less than that would be tolerated. I don't understand for the life of me. Help me figure out why my little one sentence rules of engagement cannot be implemented. If it poses a threat to an American soldier, eliminate the threat. It's that simple. Why can't that be accepted? I, it, it can be, but it's not just to an American soldier, too. It is to the interests of uh, America and to our allies. Um, you know, we have a lot of things in Afghanistan that we have put in. Obviously, we did some nation building that we need to protect. We've made some very good friends. We've got a lot of good Afghanis that are on our side. And so I get they, that. I get that. But you want to know something? They, they don't mean as much to me. <laughs> oh, I get it. They don't mean as much to me as an American soldier. Understood. So let's start. Let's start with what's most important to us. 
our armed forces, our soldiers. Rules of engagement should be simple. If it poses a threat to anybody that's a U.S. soldier, eliminate the threat. No questions asked. If it's a kid walking up to him with a bomb strapped to him and his name is Yabba Dabba Doo, eliminate the threat. Whether he's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Boko Haram or whatever. I'm just sick and tired of these damn rules of engagement making our soldiers fight, questioning every move they would make and having to think about things that they shouldn't have to think about before pulling a trigger. Well, and that's Anyhow. because you got lawyers. You got lawyers in the way. There are lawyers everywhere. Yeah. I know. Everywhere. Are. And they're and not all U.S. Too. lawyers. Yeah, they're not all U.S. lawyers either. I mean, you could have, you know, Britain, British lawyers. You may have Swedish lawyers or German lawyers. But yeah, there's lawyers everywhere. Can I take? Can I take the shot? Uh, okay, hold on. Let me let me run this. Let me see. Yeah, let me make all right. thirty. Let me make thirty-five phone calls to find out if we can take out this guy. You know, that's got an uh, RPG aimed at us. <laughs> Nuts. This is stupid. This is stupid. Ladies and gentlemen, if you agree with me and my soapbox <laughs> diatribe, please feel free to go into social media and say, you know, the United States Armed Forces should have one rules of engagement, and it should be simple. If there's a threat to a U.S. soldier, eliminate the threat. End of story, period. Done. Moving on. Bring our troops home alive. Anyhow, Denise. So uh, we got to wrap tonight's show up. Thanks for letting me get up on that uh, soapbox and no problem. See you for for a while, but I'm telling you, you couldn't shove a grease BB in my butt when I'm talking about stuff like that. It it infuriates me. Not that you would want to shove a grease BB in my butt, but you know my point. And the analogy was clever, I thought. Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Drive Time Situation Report with Denise Simon. My name is Don Newen. You are valued listeners. We appreciate the time that you devote to us, and we hope we don't let you down. We hope that some of the humor and some of the funny stuff we get into is more entertaining and never a waste of your time. If you like this show, please talk about it on social media. Please tell your friends and your family about it. Go to talkamericaradio.us. Check out the whole show lineup, all the various different shows that we've got on that network. Uh, We do it all for you. None of us are making much money on this. I know Denise and I are making no money on it. That's why I want you to go to Denise's website and send her a check. But uh, at any rate, don't send me one. I'm I'm doing it for the heck of it. But um, at any rate, we sure do appreciate everything that you guys do for us and the support you give us. And uh, we hope that we never let you down. Denise, you want to say goodnight to everybody and give them a God bless America? Uh, Denise, uh, good night, everybody, and God bless America. Thanks for being with us.